Welcome back, everyone. This is part two in our series on methods and metrics. We're going to be talking about classifier metrics. I'm sort of assuming that the metrics I'll be discussing are broadly familiar to us. I think that's a chance for us to step back and be reflective about what values these familiar metrics actually encode. Because that really is the name of the game here. No matter what kind of task you're working on or what the structure of your model is like, it's just fundamentally true that different evaluation metrics will encode different values, different goals you have for your system, and different kinds of hypotheses that you might be pursuing. And you can hear in that that really fundamentally choosing a metric is a crucial aspect to any kind of experimental work. It's a fundamental step in how we operationalize hypotheses in terms of data and models and model comparisons. As a result, you should feel free for whatever task you're working on to motivate new metrics or specific uses of existing metrics, depending on what your actual goals for your experiments actually are. Relatedly, for established tasks, you'll probably feel some pressure to use specific well-established metrics, but you should always, as a scientist, feel empowered to push back if you feel that the accepted metrics are not reflective of your hypothesis or are distorting our notions of progress somehow. Because remember, areas of research can stagnate due to poor metrics. And so we have to be vigilant. We have to be on the lookout for cases in which the metrics we've accepted might be at odds with the actual goals we have for the research we're doing. Let's begin our discussion of classifier metrics by talking about confusion matrices, a pretty fundamental data structure for a lot of the calculations that we'll perform. So by convention for my confusion matrices, I'll have the actual labels going across the rows here. And across the columns, I'll have the predictions from some classifier model. So you can see in this confusion matrix that there were 15 cases in which the model predicted positive and the actual label was positive. Where there, whereas there are 10 cases where the actual label was positive and the model predicted negative and so forth for the other values in this table. I think that seems familiar. It's something we can take for granted, but we should remember that behind the scenes here, a threshold was imposed in order to create these categorical predictions. By and large, classifier models that we use today predict probability distributions over the labels. And so in order to create an actual categorical prediction, we decided, for example, that the label with the maximum probability would be the true one. And that res the result of that decision was used to aggregate this table. But of course, different choices of that threshold might give very different results. And there might be contexts in which we want to explore the full range of probabilistic predictions. That's something I'll return to at the end of the screencast. Final note about this, it can be helpful in the context of confusion matrices to add a column for what's called support, which is simply the number of actual true instances that fall into each class. So there are 125 positive instances in this corpus, 35 negative, and over a thousand that fall in the neutral category. And that's already illuminating about how specific metrics might deal with that extremely imbalanced vector of support values. So let's start with accuracy, by far the most famous and familiar of all the classifier metrics. Accuracy is simply the number of correct predictions divided by the total number of examples. In terms of our confusion matrices, that is just the sum of all the values along the diagonal divided by the sum of all the values that are in this table. The bounds are zero and one, of course, with zero the worst and one the best. In terms of the value encoded by accuracy, I would say it's an attempt to answer the question, how often is the system correct? And that kind of feeds into the weaknesses here. So the weaknesses are first, there's no per class notion of accuracy, not directly. We just get a single holistic number. And relatedly, there is just a complete failure to control for class size. So you can see, for example, in this confusion matrix that performance on the neutral class will completely dominate the accuracy uh, values. And it's to the point in this table where no matter how much progress we make on the positive and negative classes, because they are so much smaller in terms of their support than neutral, that kind of progress is unlikely to be reflected in our accuracy values. And that's why if you return to the value encoded, you can see that just at a raw fundamental level, it is simply answering how often is the system correct. Another thing to keep in mind is that for many classifier models, the loss for those models is what's called the cross entropy loss. It's also called the 
negative log loss uh, in scikit-learn. And that value is inversely proportional to accuracy. The takeaway there is that even as we might choose other metrics to compare models and evaluate models, we should keep in mind that our classifiers themselves are kind of engines for trying to maximize accuracy. And so they are likely to inherit whatever properties and values and strengths and weaknesses are inherent in the accuracy calculation, which as we'll see, could be at odds with our actual values for the system that we're developing. And that kind of feeds nicely into precision recall and F scores, which are attempts to make up for some of the weaknesses that you see in accuracy. We'll start with precision. This is a per class notion. For a class K, it's the correct predictions for K divided by the sum of all the guesses for K that were made by your model. So in terms of this confusion matrix, if we focus on the positive class here, the numerator is the number of correct predictions for that class divided by the sum of all the values that are in this column. And for the negative class, we would repeat that. The numerator would be 15 and we would sum over the column. And finally, for neutral, the numerator would be 1,000 and we would again sum over this column. And that leads to this vector of precision values that you see along the bottom here. The bounds of precision are zero and one approximately with zero the worst and one the best. There is an important caveat here though. Precision is technically undefined in situations where a model makes no predictions about a given class because in that situation, you're dividing by zero and that's technically undefined. It is common practice to map those to zero, but we should keep in mind that we were making that extra decision. The value encoded is a kind of conservative one we're gonna penalize incorrect guesses for a certain class. So you can imagine that a failure mode there is to just rarely guess a certain class. That is the core weakness. You can achieve high precision for a class K simply by rarely guessing K. So we'll obviously need to offset that with some other pressure. And by and large, the offset pressure is recall. Recall is again a per class notion. For a class K, it's gonna be the correct predictions for K divided by the sum of all the true members of K. So now we're gonna operate row-wise. Row we focus on the positive class, our numerator is 15, the number of true predictions for the positive class, divided by the sum of all the values along the rows. That is all the true members of that class for positive. That gives us a recall value of 0.12. And we can repeat that for the other two rows. The bounds are zero and one, a zero the worst and one the best. The value encoded is a permissive one. We wanna penalize missed true cases. We would like to make a lot of predictions about a class in order to avoid leaving any out, so to speak. And that kind of leads into the core weakness. We can achieve high recall for a class K simply by always guessing K. Never mind the mistakes, as long as we get all the actual cases into our predictions, we're doing well by recall. And you can hear in that that it's important to offset this pressure by something else, and that's standardly precision. And the way we offset these two pressures is typically with F scores. So F scores are a harmonic mean of the precision and recall scores. It's again a per class notion, and it has this weighting value beta. If we wanna evenly balance precision and recall, then we set beta to one. So here's that confusion matrix again, and along this column here, I've given the per class F1 values here. The bounds are zero and one as before with zero the worst and one the best. And you can count on the fact that the F1 score for a class will always fall between the precision and recall classes because it's a kind of an average, it's the harmonic mean. What's the value encoded? The best way I can say this is that we're just essentially trying to answer the question for a given class K, how much do predictions for K align with true instances of K? That is aligning with both precision and recall as pressures. And then we can use the beta value to control how much weight we place on precision versus recall. What are the weaknesses of F scores? Well, I can really think of two. The first is that there's no normalization for the size of the data set because of the way we use the denominators for the row and column sums. And relatedly, for a given class that we decide to focus on, we actually ignore most of the data that's in the table. Consider the fact that if we decide to calculate the F1 score for the positive class, we pay attention to these column values and these row values, but we completely ignore these four values here. They're just not involved in the calculation at all. And as a result, the positive class F1 score 
might give a distorted picture of what the model's predictions are actually like in virtue of the fact that they leave out so much of the data here, as you can see. Now, because F scores are a per class notion, I think that's useful in the sense that it gives us a perspective on each one of the classes separately. But for many kinds of model evaluations, we need a summary number, a single number that we can use to compare models and assess overall progress. So we're gonna do some kind of averaging and I'd like to offer you three ways that we might average these F scores. Macro averaging, weighted averaging and micro averaging. And as you'll see, these encode quite different values about how we wanna think about the F scores. Macro averaging is a kind of averaging that we've done at various points throughout the quarter. It is simply the arithmetic mean of all the per category F1 scores. So it's just the mean of the values along this column. Its bounds are zero and one, with zero the worst and one the best. What value does it encode? Well, it's the same values that we get from F scores, plus the additional and non-trivial assumption that all of the classes are equal, regardless of size differences between them, right? And that kind of feeds into the weaknesses here. A classifier that does well only on the small classes might not actually do well in the real world. If you imagine counterfactually that for our given model here, we had really outstanding F1 scores for positive and negative and really low for neutral. That might really be at odds with how this classifier would behave in the world, assuming that most of the examples that are streaming in are in the neutral category. Relatedly, a classifier that does well only on large classes might do poorly on the small but nonetheless vital classes that are in our data. And that just reflects the fact that very often in NLP, it's the small classes that are the most precious, the ones that we care about the most. And we're not reflecting that kind of asymmetry on our values by simply taking the average of all these F scores. Weighted average F scores will give a very different perspective on model performance. In this case, we are again just gonna take an average of the F1 scores, but now weighted by the amount of support for each one of the classes. That again has bound zero to one with zero the worst and one the best. The value encoded is the same as the values that we get for the F scores, but now with the added assumption that the size of the classes, the amount of support really does matter. And that's gonna feed into the weaknesses. And the fundamental thing here is that large classes will dominate. Just as with accuracy, the larger our class is, the more it's gonna to contribute to our overall summary number. And that can lead to the kind of problematic uh, situation where the small classes are just not relevant for the evaluation metric. That could reflect your values because if what you really care about is raw rate of correct predictions, you might wanna weight the larger classes more heavily. But again, for many contexts in NLP, we really care about how much progress we can make on the small but nonetheless important classes and so in those contexts, weighted averaging is probably not the right choice. The final averaging scheme that I'd like to consider is micro-averaged F-scores. This will be very similar to weighted averaging of F1 scores and is directly connected to accuracy. The way this works is a little bit involved. We start with this core confusion matrix and we're gonna break it down into three smaller confusion matrices one per class. So you can see this one on the left here is for the positive class. The yeses are 15, and the noes are the sum of these two values here along this row. The noes are the 20, which is the sum of these two values. And then this no, no category is all the remaining data in this quadrant here. We repeat that same procedure for the negative class and for the neutral class. And then we simply sum up those three smaller tables into one big yes, no confusion matrix and calculate the F1 scores per category. And that gives us two scores here, one for yes and one for no. The bounds on this are zero and one with zero the worst and one the best. The value encoded is really easy to state. Macro averaged F1 scores for the yes category are equivalent to accuracy scores numerically. So that's identical in terms of that metric. And we have this additional problem now that, well, we have the same kind of value reflected as we have for the weighted F scores or for accuracy, but now we have brought in an additional source of uncertainty, which is we have a number for the yes category and the no category, and hence no single summary number. The convention in the literature is to focus on the yes category, but that simply brings us back to accuracy with a more involved calculation. So that's obviously not very productive. And I would say as a result here, 
the two real choices that you want to make are between macro averaging and weighted averaging of your F1 scores. And again, that will come down to what your fundamental values are and what hypotheses you're pursuing. The final point I want to make is that thus far we have operated in terms of the confusion matrix, which involved imposing a threshold on probabilistic predictions in order to create categorical values that we could then compare with precision and recall and so forth. Precision and recall curves are, offer a fundamentally different perspective. In this case, instead of imposing one threshold, we'll take every possible value that's predicted by our classifier to be a potential threshold and essentially create a bunch of confusion matrices based on that successive series of thresholds. And then we can plot the trade-off between precision here along the y-axis and recall along the x-axis for all those different notions of threshold. And that can be really illuminating in terms of helping us see how our system trades precision and recall against each other and help us find, based on values that we have about our problem and our goals, what the optimal balance between precision and recall actually is. And then if you do need a summary number of this entire table, average precision, which is implemented in scikit-learn, is a standard way of summarizing the entire curve with a single number without though imposing that single threshold that was so much shaping all of the previous metrics that we discussed. 